Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to uh, uh, call this meeting of the Board of Trustees of the City University of New York to, uh, to order. Uh, we will be going into a brief executive session uh, at the conclusion of the public uh, meeting, uh, but we will not reconvene uh, in, in a public meeting after the executive session. I would like to read the following notice into the record. The meetings of the Board of Trustees of the City University of New York are open to the public, and the Board welcomes the interest of those who attend. The public has ample opportunity to communicate with the Board. Public hearings on the Board's policy calendar are scheduled one week prior to the Board's regular meetings, and members of the public who wish to communicate with the Board are invited to express their views at such public hearings. Furthermore, the Board holds additional public hearings in all of the five boroughs at which members of the public may also speak. In addition, written communications uh, to the Board are distributed to all trustees. The Board must carry out functions assigned to it by law and therefore cannot tolerate conduct by members of the public that disrupts its meeting. In the event of disruptions, including noise, which interferes with board discussion, after appropriate warning, I will ask the security staff to remove persons engaging in disruptive conduct. The university may seek disciplinary and or criminal sanctions against persons who engage in conduct that violates the university's rules or state laws which prohibit interference with the work of public bodies. I'd like now to request that everyone take a moment to mute your cell phone or BlackBerry. Thank you. Uh, as usual, CUNY TV is transmitting uh, this public session uh, of this afternoon's meeting live on cable channel 75. The meeting is also being webcast live and can be accessed by going to www.cuny.edu. The public session of this meeting will also be available as a podcast within 24 hours uh, on the CUNY website. On behalf of the board, I would like to warmly welcome uh, newly appointed trustee Brian Overfell, who is a senior partner at the law firm of uh, Emmett, Marvin, and Martin, and who has a deep uh, lifelong commitment to education. Congratulations, uh, Trustee Oberfeld, on your unanimous confirmation by the New York Senate. We look forward to working with you. Uh, we've been in touch with our colleague, uh, former Trustee Sam Sutton, uh, to thank him for his uh, dedicated uh, service uh, uh, to the university. I would also like to uh, uh, offer the congratulations to the board to Dr. Terrence Martell, who has been elected as chair of the University Faculty Senate, and as such is our new trustee representing uh, the faculty. Dr. Martell is the director of the Weissman Center for International Business at Baruch College, where he is also the Sachs Distinguished Professor of Finance. Welcome to you, Terry. We look forward to we know Dr. Martell well from his membership on the Board's Committee on Fiscal Affairs, the Subcommittee on Investment, and the Subcommittee on Audit. Uh, Dr. Cooper, would you like to say a few words of introduction for Mr. Mar Dr. Martell? Well, you've took most of the words out of my mouth, so what's the point of repeating? Terry Martell has served as Vice Chair of the University Faculty Senate for the past two years. He has been devoted, hardworking, and brought to the Senate a position and a point of view that was not available before. I am delighted to pass this job on to him. You have no idea how happy this makes me. And good luck. Thank you. I'm sure you are. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, <clears throat> congratulations to Trustee Rita DiMartino, who recently received the Global Spanish Latino Awards 2012 Lifetime Achievement Award for Individuals of Puerto Rican Descent. And I'd like to congratulate CUNY Law School Associate Dean Mary Lou Billick, who was recently named as the new uh, top administrator of the UMass School of Law at Dartmouth. 
Uh, this took place just a few months after former Associate uh, Dean Penelope Andrews accepted the leadership of the Albany Law School. It uh, appears that the CUNY School of Law has become a launching pad for uh, law school deans. I, I take this as yet another example of CUNY Law School's recent success. The board held its Bronx Borough hearing on Monday, June 18th, uh, 2012. Board Chair uh, Person Phil Barry chaired the meeting. That was also attended by trustees uh, Ugo Morales, Kafui Kawaku, and Sandy Cooper, uh, members of the Chancellery and the Bronx College uh, presidents or their representatives. A summary of the proceedings uh, has been circulated to the trustees and the Chancellor's cabinet, and a transcript of that hearing is available in the office uh, of the secretary. I want to extend our deepest condolences to the family of Dr. Richard Trent, who passed away on June 9th. A World War II veteran, Richard received his doctorate from Columbia University in 1955. He was the founding president of uh, Medgar Evers College and served from March 1970 to October 1982. He returned to teaching at Brooklyn College after his uh, retirement. Uh, he will be de deeply uh, missed. Now may I call on Trustee Rita DiMartino uh, for a resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a resolution of appreciation for Dr. Eduardo Marti. Whereas Dr. Eduardo Marti was named the first CUNY Vice Chancellor for Community Colleges by Chancellor Matthew Goldstein in June 2010, with the unanimous approval of the Board of Trustees, and whereas prior to his appointment as Vice Chancellor for Community Colleges, Dr. Marti joined the City University of New York in July 2000 as President of Queensborough Community College, where he served with the highest distinction overseeing advances in student enrollment, curricular innovation, faculty research, government relations, campus facilities, and fundraising. And whereas Dr. Marti led four community colleges prior to joining the university and has been a consistent and effective advocate for community college education and a leader in developing ways to challenge and support community college students, and whereas Dr. Marti, who left Cuba in 1960 and was the first in his family to achieve a college degree, has been an eloquent and steadfast supporter of CUNY's proud tradition of welcoming and serving immigrants and the children of immigrants, and whereas Dr. Marti was appointed by, by Mayor Michael Bloomberg to the Department of Education's panel for educational policy in 2011 and appointed by Governor Elliot Spitzer to the New York State Commission on Higher Education in 2007, chairing its Workforce and Economic Development Committee, and whereas Dr. Marti conceived and organized the first National Colloquium on Community Colleges in September 2011, reimagining community colleges, which was attended by more than 50 presidents from 26 states, as well as community college faculty and researchers. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of the City University of New York expresses its heartfelt appreciation to Dr. Eduardo Marti for his exemplary dedication and distinguished leadership at the City New University of New York. Hear, hear. Thank you very much. I'd like to call on Trustee Kathleen Pasilli to read a resolution. Thank you, Mr. 
let, since the Eduardo Marti resolution is um, somewhat controversial, let's take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? <laughs> we still thank you, Eduardo. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if I may say just, just a, a word. Uh, today, well, actually Friday, will be my last day in CUNY. And it's a wonderful circle because I started in CUNY in 1966 as a faculty member at Borough of Manhattan Community College. And uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful way to end a long and very happy career. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the Board of Trustees for your confidence. And most of all, I want to thank Chancellor Goldstein for his confidence in me. Thank you. I'd like to call on Trustee Kathleen Pasilli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Resolution of appreciation for Dr. Tomas Morales. Whereas Dr. Tomas Morales was unanimously named the third president of the College of Staten Island in June 2007, upon recommendation by Chancellor Matthew Goldstein, by the Board of Trustees. And whereas during his tenure at the College of Staten Island, Dr. Morales worked tirelessly to enhance the college's mission and reputation by restructuring academic departments and recruiting experienced administrators, advancing the work of the High Performance Computing Center, supporting undergraduate research, overseeing the groundbreaking of a new residence hall, strengthening partnerships with communities and organizations across Staten Island, and coordinating the university's outreach efforts with legislators at the borough and state levels. And whereas Dr. Morales, a nationally prominent educator whose career spans over 30 years, has demonstrated his deep commitment to public higher education through his outstanding work in senior administrative positions at the three largest public university systems in our nation, California State University, the State University of New York, and the City University of New York. And whereas Dr. Morales has taken the leading role in advocating for accessible and high quality education for all students, serving as board member and co-chair of the National Task Force on College Readiness of the American Association of State Colleges on the American Council on Education's Commission on Racial and Ethnic Equality, and on the governing board and as secretary of the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. And whereas Dr. Morales was appointed by Mayor Michael Bloomberg to the New York City Panel on Educational Policy and was awarded the Professional Achievement Award in Education from Boracua College, and whereas Dr. Morales serves as a board member of the Staten Island University Hospital Foundation and has been recognized by several community organizations, receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award in education from the New York League of Puerto Rican Women, the Effective Leadership Golden Age Award from the Latino Center on Aging, and the Staten Island Chamber of Commerce Lewis Miller Business Leadership Award among many other significant recognitions now and therefore be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of the City University of New York expresses its heartfelt appreciation to Dr. Morales for his exemplary dedication and distinguished leadership as president of the College of Staten Island. Thank you. I'll second that motion. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed abstentions? That carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like now to call on uh, Vice Chair Phil Berry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, for Dr. Kenneth Olden, whereas uh, Dr. Kenneth Olden was named the acting and founding dean of the CUNY School of Public Health at Hunter College and the acting dean of the Hunter College Schools of Health Professions 
in September 2008 by the Board of Trustees, and whereas uh, Dr. Olden worked tirelessly to establish a world-class school of public health, successfully transforming highly regarded university-wide programs in public health into the CUNY School of Public Health at Hunter College, which was granted full accreditation by the Council on Education for Public Health in 2011. And whereas during his tenure, Dr. Olden was instrumental in the planning and execution of the CUNY School of Public Health at Hunter College's move to its current location in East Harlem in 2011, where it shares space with the Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College, Hunter College's Institute for the Study of Puerto Ricans, and the Hunter College East Harlem Art Gallery. And whereas, Dr. Olden recruited renowned scholars to join the CUNY School of Public Health, engaging them to work collaboratively with students, researchers, and community organizations to develop innovative approaches to improving the well-being of urban populations in New York City and beyond. And whereas, Dr. Olden is a distinguished researcher who demonstrated a profound commitment to public health during his career as director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Toxicology Program, the first African American to become director of one of the 18 institutes of the National Institutes of Health, and as a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Science, and whereas Dr. Olden received the 2011 Richard and Barbara Hansen Leadership Award for his sustained contributions in the field of public health. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of the City University of New York expresses its heartfelt appreciation to Dr. Kenneth Olden for his exemplary dedication and distinguished leadership as acting and founding dean of this CUNY School of Public Health. May I second that? Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Thank you, Ken. Uh, may I now call on uh, Trustee Valerie Beal to announce college and faculty honors? <coughs> Community College is chosen as one of 10 community colleges across the country to take the lead in bridging cultures to form a nation, differences, community, and democratic thinking, a new initiative focused on civic learning through the humanities. Congratulations, Kingsboro. Two Hunter, <laughs> Two Hunter College faculty have received significant awards. Silverman School of Social Work Professor Deborah Tolman was recognized for her groundbreaking work in gender and media literacy by receiving the 2012 Real Deal Award from Scenarios USA, and CUNY School of Public Health Professor Franklin Meyer received the American Industrial Hygiene Association's 2012 Donald E. Cummings Memorial Award. Congratulations to both. Two Queens College faculty have won Fulbright scholarships. Comparative Literature Professor Andrea Kalil to conduct sociopolitical research in Tunisia, and Education Professor Mathilis Wamba to develop a master's program in teaching at Malawi, Africa. Congratulations to both. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Uh, may I call on Trustee Kathleen Facilli to announce student and alumni honors? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All seven 2012 Kaplan Educational Foundation Leadership Program Scholars hail from CUNY Community Colleges. They are Goodwin Bofel, Kimoni Martin, Ariella Rosa of Bronx Community College, Adonis Billy, Denise Reynoso of Hostos, and Gabriel Flores and Jacina Preocado of Kingsborough. And all seven 2012 Kaplan Scholars are transferring to senior, scholars, uh, senior colleges and university come from our CUNY, our CUNY Community Colleges as well. They are Shara Concepcion, 
Ayanna Wellington of Bronx, of Borough Manhattan Community College, Leonardo Minier, and Abdul Azuku Treyarche of uh, Bronx Community College, Mariana Rivera and Enoch Sowa of Hostos, and Shakayalana Lawrence of Kingsborough. Congratulations to all of you. Two Macaulay Honors College students at Hunter College have received significant rewards, uh, one in chemistry, Senior Patrick Lee, a Fulbright Fellowship for the years 2012 to 2013, to work as a teaching assistant in Macau, China, and political science major, Simrut Paul Kayor, a Humanity in Action Fellowship to study human rights in Poland this summer. Congratulations to both of you. Queens College 2012 graduate Tara Gildea received a rare Beneke scholarship to help pay for her graduate studies at Oxford University, where she researched Jane Austen on a Macaulay Honor, uh, Opportunities Fund last summer. And Queens College, Aaron Copeland, School of Music graduate student Jonathan Springer received a Fulbright Award to study percussion in India for an extended time. Congratulations. That concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. A list of grants and gifts received by the university since our April 30th, 2012 meeting uh, is available uh, on the table and in your calendar book. I'd like now to call on Chancellor Goldstein to present his report. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, echo your uh, words uh, of welcome to uh, Trustee Brian Oberfell. Uh, we look forward to working with you, Brian, and Terry Martell. Uh, uh, we welcome you as well and look forward to working with the Senate. Uh, this is always a joyous and celebratory time of the year. Uh, an estimated 47,000 CUNY degrees were conferred during the 2011-2012 academic year. 14,800 uh, associate degrees, 21,500 baccalaureate degrees, and 11,000 graduate degrees. Mr. Chairman, this represents a 37.6% increase since 2001, and during that period of time, as all of you know, the university has worked very hard to increase our standards quite significantly, and those who were naysayers uh, of this reform movement uh, that uh, followed uh, the uh, splendid report that was chaired by our chairman uh, now uh, have something to reflect upon because we've never seen growth of this kind of magnitude uh, in, in our history and something that we're all very delighted uh, about. So I want to thank uh, all of the trustees, alumni, and friends who participated in the commencement ceremonies and graduation across uh, the university. The Macaulay Honors College, uh, where uh, I attended as uh, a, um, an observer, uh, along with Bill Macaulay, who has uh, been there every day since the uh, college's uh, inception, were impressed by uh, where our students are going. And let's, let me just mention a partial list, because uh, this is something that is, again, a game changer for uh, this university. Uh, we have graduates now going to the Albert Einstein uh, College of Medicine in their joint MD-PhD programs, um, uh, PhD students going to Berkeley and Cambridge and Columbia University at Columbia. Uh, we have students going to their medical school and their law school. Uh, the University of Chicago for their law school, Duke University School of Law, Georgetown School of Law, Harvard School of Law, Harvard Medical School, Johns Hopkins, Mount Sinai School of Medicine, PhD programs at Harvard and MIT. We had six or eight students accepted to NYU's law school, and a, a number are going uh, this year, I believe it's four, PhD programs at the University of Michigan, the University of Texas at Austin. We have students going to Yale School of Medicine, 
and the list goes on. It's something I think we all uh, are deeply proud of. Others have accepted very coveted uh, invitations to join uh, internship programs at some of the major companies that are uh, have their headquarters here uh, in, uh, in New York City. So on behalf of all who helped these students launch their extraordinary careers, starting with our faculty, staff, and administrators, I thank you for the extraordinary work that you have done to shape these uh, young people and others throughout uh, the university. Uh, ASAP and uh, the new community college, I'd just like to give you a quick update. After speaking of re realizing potential, the results of our ASAP initiative have been amazing. The 2,500 participants in ASAP to date have a combined three-year graduation rate of 56%. By way of comparison, a similar group of CUNY students and comparable data nationally, the number is about 23%. Just this month, just this month, MDRC, the nation's leading research organization, confirmed what is called ASAP's very promising findings. In 10 years of studying community college programs, it has said it has never seen such large effects. Given these outstanding results, we plan to expand ASAP in order to serve about 4,000 students by 2014. And if we are able to raise the money that is needed to make this number even higher, we will continue to do so. Our new community college, as all of you know, uh, now uh, managed uh, at the top by Scott Evanbeck, is so to, set to open in the fall and incorporates several of the values and experiences we have learned uh, in the <coughs> ASAP. Uh, what jobs are available today for our graduates? Well, we wanted to find that out. I asked um, that a task force be established to not only ask that fundamental questions about where the jobs will be in the future, but what skills are needed for those jobs and what should we be doing to prepare students for the workforce? Those are the questions that I asked the CUNY Jobs Task Force to address. The task force report called Jobs for New York's Future is now available. All of you have at your, your places um, hard copies uh, for you to peruse. Uh, this, this report was sent to the governor uh, members of the state legislature, the city council, uh, national and local workforce development organizations, national and local foundations, and higher education leaders, including uh, all constituencies here at the university. Uh, I would uh, ask that you take a look at this jobs uh, task force because there are things that are new and fresh uh, that we hope to develop a, a, a plan uh, for implementation uh, very soon. I'd like to thank uh, Rick Schaefer, our very distinguished uh, general counsel who chaired the task force uh, and the task force uh, members and, and the interviewees, and most importantly, the staff who coordinated and authored the report, the Director of Workforce Development, Shane Spaulding, University Associate Dean for Continuing Education, Suri Deitch, Leslie Hirsch, and Ronnie Cowder from the Center for Urban Research at the Graduate Center, and Teresa Desmond uh, of my office. With respect to the New York City Regional Economic Development Council, uh, let me say that my work as chair of the New York City Regional Economic Development Council continues. Uh, this was at the request of uh, Governor Cuomo. In the second round of competition, we are competing for a number of other regions in the state for uh, tax incentive support and uh, for uh, capital support. Higher education, 
Business industry partnerships will be an area of focus for our next iteration. Joining the um, group of very distinguished people uh, that I'm pleased uh, to be connected with are now Shelley Silver, Speaker Silver, and Senate, Senator Martin Golden, and our own trustee, uh, Wellington Chen, who was asked by the governor to uh, be part of that council. Tomorrow is the inaugural meeting of, the gov of Governor Cuomo's new New York Education Reform Commission, the commission comprising education, community, and business leaders from across the state we will examine the current structure of the state's education system, including teacher recruitment and performance, student achievement, education funding and costs, parent and family engagement, problems facing high need districts, and the best use of technology in the classroom. Governor Cuomo continues to look to us uh, to help, and we are uh, very pleased to be asked to be part of that um, uh, important um, activity. With respect to the city budget, I provided testimony on the city's FY 2013 executive proposal at a joint higher education and finance committee hearing of the city council that took place on May 18th. We continue to discuss the university's budget priorities with both sides of city hall, and it is expected that the mayor and city council will shake hands on an adopted budget very soon. This coming Thursday, I will travel to Dallas, Texas with uh, Deputy Mayor Bob Steele uh, at the first U.S. News and World Report STEM Solutions 2012. The panel that uh, Bob Steele and myself will uh, conduct is titled, What's Going On in STEM in New York City? driving successful outcomes through effective partnerships. I look forward to highlighting our many citywide initiatives and partnerships. For example, NYU Center for Urban Science and Progress, the New York, uh, New York Structural Biology Center, as well as the progress we have made in CUNY's own decade of science initiatives. For example, strengthening doctoral programs in the sciences creating professional master's programs, and encouraging undergraduate research. This fall, CUNY will partner again with U.S. News and World Report and the Daily News to host a STEM conference in New York City. Meanwhile, construction is well underway at the site of the CUNY Advanced Science Research Center on the City College campus, and with the leadership of Vice Chancellor Jillian Small, we are actively recruiting top faculty to direct each of the areas of foci, photonics, nanotechnology, water and environmental sensing, structural biology, and neuroscience. We look forward to the opening of the center, which is scheduled for August 2014. With respect to grant activity here at the university, we estimate that total award activity for the university in the current fiscal year will exceed $400 million. Over the past decade, we have seen award volume increase by over 33%. Federal support increased by 43% and true research activity increased by over 59%. With the ASRC and other new and renovated science facilities coming online in the next several years, CUNY should hit the half a billion dollar mark in total award activity within three to five years. Benno, I only reflect of, about your report that you wrote a dozen years ago and what those numbers are and how they pale with respect to the numbers today. Uh, so again, I congratulate our faculty, the ones uh, primarily responsible for this very impressive uh, uh, success that we've uh, achieved, and just um, encourage them to continue to do the very good work. 
Uh, on the non-research area, some notable grants uh, were also announced very recently, a million dollar award from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to support the launch of the new CUNY Community College. So I congrat you, congratulate you, uh, President Scott Evenbeck. A $1 million grant from the Robin Hood Foundation to support the scaling up of the ASAP. Kudos to ASAP Executive Director Donna Lindemann. The Robin Hood Foundation also gave us $1.2 million to support our at-home in college program, which works with over 2,000 students in 63 schools to help them prepare for a successful transition to college. Kudos to University Director of Collaborative Programs, Eric Hoffman, and Director of the At Home in College Program, Daniel Volok. And finally, we received a, another $1.2 million from the Helena Rubenstein Foundation to support the endowment created last year to support continuing education scholarships bringing that total to over $2.1 million. Congratulations to Associate Dean of Adult and Continuing Education, Suri Deitch. And lastly, I would like to congratulate President Felix Matos Rodriguez for receiving the Education Award at the Aspira Circle of Achiev Achievers Dinner on June 13th, as well as being selected as this year's Grand Marshal of the National Puerto Rican Day Parade, which took place uh, just a few weeks ago. And uh, lastly, Mr. Chairman, just a few hours ago, I was pleased to give what was called a keynote address at the uh, Education Update Distinguished Leaders in Education Award Ceremonies and three of our very distinguished members of the CUNY fami uh, family were, um, were recognized. First, our own Jay Hershenson, who we now just call Jay because he's just so well known by everybody in the city, Tomas Morales and Jennifer Rabb. All spoke beautifully and we were very pleased <coughs> to be part of that impressive ceremony this morning. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Are there comments or questions for the Chancellor on his report? Professor Cooper. Not precisely, if you don't mind. I just would like to take this opportunity to ask the trustees who received a letter that I sent, as opposed to my reading it out loud, to take the opportunity to read it. There are points in there which were made powerfully last Monday at the public hearing by my colleagues, and I really think it's crucial for you to hear and understand what they were talking about. The subject is ways of dealing with transfer that improves rather than destroys the curriculum we have created. The letter is fairly clear. I'm not reading it because it's too long, and I know you'd rather get on with other business. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Uh, if not, we'll, uh, we'll move to the uh, items requiring uh, a vote. Uh, you have on the table the Chancellor's uh, University Report for June 25th, 2012. Uh, and I want to add one uh, table item uh, that refers to the appointment of Dr. Fred Nader as Interim Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost at the College of Staten Island. You'll find a copy of this uh, uh, table item uh, in, your, in your place. Uh, I would like to move the adoption of the Chancellor's University Report. May I have a second? Second. Any discussion, comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Chancellor's report carries. Next, I'd like to uh, move the approval of the minutes of the regular board meeting uh, and the executive session of April 30th, 2012. You'll find a copy of the draft minutes uh, in section two of your board book. Uh, may I have a second? Second. Are there any revisions to the minutes or comments? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 
Any opposed? Abstentions? The minutes uh, are approved. We'll turn now to our uh, committee reports. We'll hear first uh, from the Committee on Fiscal Affairs, uh, uh, Trustee Joe Loda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Committee on Fiscal Affairs, the Subcommittee on Audit, and the Subcommittee on Investment met in joint session on June 4th. Uh, the meeting commenced with a report on the 2012-2016 City University Master Plan by Associate Vice Chancellor Matthew Sapienza and Executive Vice Chancellor Alexa Logue. Once the presentation was completed, the committee returned to its regular agenda and proceeded to approve the minutes uh, from its prior meeting on April 2nd. The committee then proceeded to approve the following resolutions. Calendar item 3A is a resolution to authorize the university to choose a beverage manufacturer to be the exclusive provider of soft drinks, teas, waters, juices, and certain other beverages to the university in exchange for the payment of royalties and other valuable considerations to the university and college-related entities. The term of the contract or contracts resulting from the solicitation process shall either be five or ten years without renewals as determined in the best interest of the university. Mr. Chairman, I move the approval and adoption of calendar item 3A. Uh, I'll second that motion. Are there questions for the committee on, on pouring rights? <laughs> Not all in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? 3A carries. Calendar item 3B is a resolution requesting the Board of Trustees of the University to authorize the General Counsel to execute contracts on behalf of the University to pay for purchase cleaning, maintenance, and paper products. The contract shall be available for the use by all constituent colleges, and the total cost shall not exceed $6 million per fiscal year. University-wide contracts for these commodities will maximize the buying power of the University and provide standard products and prices for all of the colleges. Mr. Chairman, I move the approval and adoption of calendar item 3B. I'll second that. Are there questions for the committee? Not all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? 3B carries. Calendar item 3C is a resolution authorizing the university to discontinue the university's accelerated study fee. The application of this fee has been increasing administrative burden over the years. It continues to place greater responsibility for academic counseling matters on fiscal administrators by applying a fee for taking additional course, courses, which disadvantages many students with limited financial resources. Discontinuation of the fee has the support of the <coughs> university's Office of Academic Affairs. Mr. Chairman, I move the approval and adoption of calendar item 3C. I'll second that. Are there questions for the committee? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? 3C carries. Following the approval of all of the action items by the committee, Associate Vice Chancellor Sapienza gave an update on the fiscal year 2012-2013 New York State and New York City budgets. Following his report, the Subcommittee on Audit was convened. After approval of the minutes of its prior meeting, KPMG, our outside auditors, gave a report on the 2012 audit plan, which was substantially uh, excuse me, which was subsequently approved by the members of the subcommittee. Following the adjournment of the subcommittee on audit, the subcommittee on investment was convened. After approval of the minutes of the meeting of its prior subcommittee meeting, uh, the meeting was adjourned to go into executive session for asset allocation review and recommendations. After re uh, resuming the public meeting, the adoption of the recommendations to increase real assets and emerging markets by 5% and 1% respectively, and to decrease fixed income, U.S. equity, and non-U.S. equity by 5%, 0.5%, and 0.5% respectively were approved. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my report. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll turn next to the Committee on Academic uh, Policy Programs and Research. I'd like to call on Trustee Wellington Chen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At its June 4, 2012 meeting, the committee approved the following policy matters. Calendar number 4A, the City University of New York 2012-2016 Master Plan. Every four years, the Board of Regents of the Department of Education of the State of New York requires CUNY to submit a master plan for the following four years. The current plan articulates the wide-ranging goals of the university for 2012 and 2016 and the steps net needed to reach those goals. 
CUNY goals are grouped into four categories. Academic excellence, maintaining the university as integrated system and facilitating articulation, expansion of access and responsiveness to the needs of the university urban setting. Calendar number 4B, New York City College of Technology, BTEC in Electrical Engineering Technology. This degree completion is for those holding an associate's degree in a related field. The program will provide in-depth education and training in control systems, instrumentation systems, communication systems, and power electronic systems. The program requires mathematics and general ed education courses beyond the associate degree, providing students with the tools to integrate concepts from other relevant disciplines. The program prepares students for entering employment as technologists. Calendar number 4C, Queensborough Community College, closing the medical engineering, technology, and design drafting department. Historically, Queensborough Community College has had two relatively small academic departments in related fields of study. One, mechanical engineering technology and design drafting, and the other, electrical and computer engineering. These two departments are now merging and will be known as the Department of Engineering Technology. The combined department will continue uh, offering all related programs currently existing at the college. Calendar number 4D, Graduate School and University Center, Institute for Language Education in Transcultural Context. The proposed institute is expected to play a vital role in fostering the study of foreign languages at CUNY campuses. Particular attention will be given through the strategic coordination of programming to support languages whose enrollment numbers do not justify their being offered at every member institution, or that are at risk of not being offered at all. The Graduate Center will be the host campus with Hunter and Queens Colleges joining as partners in the pilot years. As a large urban university in the nation's most linguistically diversity, CUNY is uniquely poised to undertake this project in support of preserving and enhancing linguistic resources. Calendar number 4E, Hunter College, CUNY Institute for Education Policy at Roosevelt House. This institute will focus on analysis, discussion, and dissemination of policy initiatives affecting public education at every level. The institute will concentrate on current reform agendas and policy initiatives that show promise for the future, and it will be directed by David M. Steiner, who is the Clara and Larry Silverstein Dean at Hunter College School of Education. Dr. Steiner has previously served as Commissioner of Education for the State of New York. Calendar number 4F, Graduate School and University Center, PhD in Nursing. This action item does not create a new program per se, but rather calls for a change in the degree awarded for the existing Doctor of Nursing Science program. The distinction between the DNS, which is a research doctorate, and the PhD, which is also a research doctorate, has decreased over time. As a result, most DNS programs across the country have already converted to PhD programs. In response to this national trend, consistent with the accrediting body's recommendations, and given that DNS curriculum at CUNY has already been strengthened as appropriate for a PhD program, the program is now ready to be termed a PhD. Calendar number 4G and 4H. College of Staten Island and Hunter College, DPT in physical therapy. These items also involve a change in the registration of an existing program. At present, CUNY only has a single DPT registration with the Graduate Center as the granting institution and CSI and Hunter as the non-granting partners. The program was originally registered this way because historically, the granting of all doctoral degrees at CUNY occur at the Graduate Center. However, with the recent increase at CUNY of professional doctoral degrees, particularly in the health sciences, an update of this policy became necessary. And a few years ago, it was decided that on a case-by-case -case basis, campuses other than Graduate Center could bestow professional doctorates. In reality, the DPT program has already functioned as two separate programs taught on the two participating campuses. The national accrediting body also considers the Hunter and CSI programs to be separate entities and already accredits them separately. The proposed change of degree authority would thus bring the state education department registration in line with the reality how the programs are being taught and accredited. 
because, uh, because this will be the first doctoral degree, level degree program offered by CSI, this action will also require change of the college master plan. Calendar number 4I, honorary degrees to be awarded at Hunter and Megas Evers Colleges. Hunter College seek to award Carmen Beauchamp C. Parikh, Senior Associate Judge, New York City Court of State of Appeals, the Honorary Doctor of Law. Judge C. Parikh is a Hunter College alumna, class of 63, who's also, who has had a distinguished career in the municipal and state law. The first judge of Hispanic background to be appointed to the Court of Appeals. She's recognized for her long-standing commitment to fostering diversity in the legal profession. Megas Evers College seeks to award John Rufin, Director of National Center for Minority Health and, and, and Health Disparities, the, the Honor Doctor of Science, and Winston Marsalis, the award-winning jazz musician, the Honorary Doctor of Fine Arts. Dr. Rufin is a well-respected leader and visionary in the field of minority health disparities. As a scholar, he has devoted his professional career to improving the health status of underserved populations. He has successfully developed programs to increase the cadre of minority scientists, physicians, and other, and other health professionals. Winston Masalas is a renowned jazz musician who has won a total of eight Grammy Awards. He's also, he's a co-founder and the artistic director of Jazz at Lincoln Center, an arts facility at for jazz performances and educational programs. Item number 4A through 4I were approved by the committee and I recommend the approval by the board, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I'll second those items. Are there any questions on any of the uh, items 4A through I? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed abstentions? Those items carry. Information items. Vice Chancellor Gillian Small described a new initiative of her office, the CUNY Hub for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. This is a new CUNY facility uh, established to promote entrepreneurship and provide assistance, essential services, and appropriate space to start up companies created by the CUNY faculty. The hub is especially important for faculty who receive small business innovation research and small business technology transfer grants. The hub will occupy 7,100 feet at 200, 215 West 125th Street is expected to house about 15 companies after 18 months and 26 companies by the end of the third year. Executive Vice Chancellor Alexandra Lowe reported on the continual progress of the Pathways Project. Colleges are deep in the process of creating new general education courses. The courses for the Common Core are being submitted for approval to a CUNY wide faculty review committee Work is also be, is progressing well al on aligning the first courses for the largest transfer majors. Seven transfer committees have completed their work and four more have begun. Progress is also being made, modifying our software system to accommodate the new academic requirements. Executive Vice Chancellor Lowe also reported that the new community college is on track to open a schedule in September with an initial class of 300 students at the end of the summer, the new community college will have an accreditation site visit by the New York State Education Department and is expected to be accredited by the New York State by the end of the fall. That concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Chancellor, do you have a comment? Yes, uh, you know, the, the development and uh, support of a master plan is a big deal uh, for the university because uh, in part it is a lens on our future but it also is the derivative of where our budget requests uh, come from uh, and it required an enormous amount of work and I'd like to just uh, very very quickly uh, acknowledge first and foremost Executive Vice Chancellor Lexa Logue who really uh, did the lion's share of organizing and uh, developing uh, the themes for uh, the master plan. Uh, thanks also to the many faculty. We had an extraordinary amount of faculty who expressed interest and in helped to define the issues and uh, help with the narrative about explaining why we are approaching some of the challenges 
uh, the way we did and the large numbers of staff and students from across the university as well as our <coughs> college presidents and other administrators who provided written comments or participated in interviews concerning their areas of responsibility. A number of our members of our board came forward with a number of suggestions and I want to thank you for that. Uh, the large number of staff in the Office, office of Academic Affairs who worked tirelessly to put this together, <coughs> uh, the members of the Chancellery, and finally, uh, Britt Kerwin, uh, the Chancellor of the University of Maryland, who I asked to serve as a, an external reviewer, uh, who really said uh, he's at, been asked to do this on a number of occasions but had never seen a master plan as uh, forward-thinking and as comprehensive and as well-argued as the one that he saw from CUNY. So all of you, uh, kudos for your good work and um, uh, we deeply appreciate the time spent on task uh, for this important, uh, important work. Thank you very much. I'll turn next to the Committee on Faculty, Staff and Administration, uh, Trustee Valerie Beal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will now present the items that the Committee for Faculty, Staff, and Administration considered at its meeting on June 6, 2012 for the Board's approval. In addition, we have two items that were received after our meeting that we deem significant, significant enough to bring to you today. I will share those items at the end of my report. Item 5A amends the University's policy on the acceptable use of computer resources to address issues that have arisen since the policy was adopted in 2007. Among other points, the amendments clarify that the policy applies to all faculty, full-time, part-time, and abjunct, and to both current and former users of CUNY computer resources. CUNY's rights to review a user's CUNY account include the right to review personal messages. Information in a CUNY user's account, including personal messages, may be subject to disclosure under FOIL. CUNY has the right and obligation to copy a user's account or hard drive without inspecting it at any time for preservation of evidence without notice to the user and CUNY users may request an exception or waiver of one or more provisions of the policy. Mr. Chair, I present item 5A for the board's consideration. Thank you very much. You have a copy of the full policy in your board book. Uh, I'll second that motion. Are there questions for the committee? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Thank you. Item 5B concerns the adoption of a salary plan for titles within the university's executive compensation plan following a periodic assessment consistent with the plan's requirement that it be reviewed no less frequently than every five years. Chairman Smith, I understand that you wish to speak to this matter. Yes, you have a copy of the, um, of the new salary plan in your book. Uh, I would like to suggest one revision uh, based on this letter which I received uh, from the Chancellor. Uh, dear Benno, as you know, the Board of Trustees is scheduled to consider revisions in the CUNY Executive Compensation Plan at its uh, meeting on June 25th. I'm requesting uh, one revision uh, in the plan. Under the column labeled Salary Range is Effective uh, 6 2012 for the Chancellor, the proposed minimum and maximum salary ranges for the position should be deleted. Instead, the following words should be included. Quote, future salary to be determined by the Board of Trustees, close quote. I'm not requesting any other changes in the plan and wish to take this opportunity to reiterate that no salary increases for any individuals under the executive pay plan are being proposed. This simply establishes new ranges. I remain deeply grateful for the support of the board, the Committee on Faculty, Staff, and Administration, and the Ad Hoc Committee on Compensation, which worked so diligently on this plan. Uh, with this change, uh, I recommend its approval. 
So, Trustee Beal, if, if you are uh, agreeable, I would like your motion uh, to continue with the revision that I described. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I accept your revision. Um, therefore, I, I will submit item 5B, adoption of a salary plan for titles within the executive compensation plan as revised for the board's consideration. I'll thank you very much. Is there discussion of the new executive salary plan? Yes. Uh, Trustee Pantaleo. Uh, Chairman, I was a member of this, uh, the ad hoc compensation committee, and I think a couple of points need to be made that are relevant about this plan because I believe there's some misunderstanding. As was stated, it is not proposing a raise or an increase for anyone. That's not what this is. It is, is merely a, a normal executive compensation procedure to have ranges. However, we engaged a consultant to do this, and the consultant looked at market surveys and engaged in comparative analysis of peer institutions and systems. It should be noted that we actually did not take the consultant's recommendation on the bottom end of the range. It was necessary for us to actually lower the bottom end of the range to cover the folks who are actually being paid under that range. Had we accepted the consultant's recommendation, it would have resulted in uh, presumably uh, immediate or pretty close to immediate salary increases. Uh, not that I would specify I think that's a bad idea, but uh, nevertheless, to deal with the realities that we are dealing with, irrespective of the fact that peer institutions' bottom salary for these job classifications are often materially higher than our bottom salaries for that, and notwithstanding the fact that many of these peer institutions are not in markets such as New York that is uh, singularly one of the most expensive places to live in the United States, and frankly, further notwithstanding the fact that many of the people who are affected at the bottom range of these uh, salary ranges and who will not be getting an increase because we lowered it are handling budgets and matters and administrative tasks in a high, of a highly complex nature for which they would expect to get market-based remuneration and they have not. And the final thing I would say that we did not consider is we did not consider the fact that others in the university, not the least of which are other uh, professionals within the university, have been routinely getting salary increases and we routinely mark them to market, if you will, by reference to their collective bargaining agreements, we decided to lower that range. So I do think it's important that people understand this is not, one, a backdoor way to immediately provide salary increases irrespective of the merits for doing so. And that's very important. And uh, two, that CUNY now finds itself, based on the reports of Mercer, one of the top uh, executive and management compensation consultants in the world of paying not insignificantly below market value for its professional and administrative staff. Irrespective of that, I, I would just urge as a member of the ad hoc committee that this, these salary ranges be approved. They are a small step, but they are uh, nevertheless the, the best that we felt that we can do in these very difficult times. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Trustee just Weisenfeld. On, just, just on the last point by, uh, by you, Trustee Pantaleo, what you very skillfully also tried to uh, skim over is that for years that we've been on the board, and this question comes up every few years, uh, whether instigated by whatever party, this ex ex extreme striving for egalitarianism in every approach on everything that's forced on the board, even though the board has taken great care, as you pointed out, to take uh, an accounting of current economic conditions in not providing for the increases that could be provided for if, relevant, if they were relevant to the marketplace. But nonetheless, uh, the board gets a lot of hell, the chancellery gets a lot of hell, and it's, it's just needless rancor with which students and others could be using their energy more productively and they're instigated to, to get into a conflict that doesn't even exist where the board is already conscious of this. And that's the one thing that I think respectfully was, was glossed over and it's gotta be made a point because it doesn't help the university. Mr. Chair. Thank you, other comments, uh, Trustee Beal? Um, and I will just add that I regretfully accepted the chancellor's gracious offer to remove his compensation from this um, study. 
as we noticed, it was a compensation plan. It was not an attempt to institute a payroll, a pay increase. Um, but the, the, the chancellor has graciously removed his compensation from the study, and uh, I re appreciate his willingness to do that. Um, having said that, please know that the, the plan was done, as we said, by outside consultants and reflective of market conditions. Uh, it, it should be said that the chancellor's own compensation is considerably below market. Uh, particularly given the, the enormous complexity and size of CUNY uh, as a system, and particularly given the fact that he is the most outstanding public university leader in the country, uh, without a doubt. Uh, but uh, my efforts to, over the years, persuade him to take a compensation that more justly and fairly reflects his value to the university uh, and what he would easily be paid were he to uh, go anywhere else. Uh, he has resisted that uh, every year because of the, uh, the general financial exigencies faced by our university system and because of the symbolism entailed in, in what his compensation level is relative to others. Uh, uh, at the university, but I, <laughs> I'm going to continue with my interest in trying to move everyone's salaries up to competitive levels because uh, uh, it, you're just asking for trouble if uh, if you don't uh, uh, if you don't try to uh, uh, to do that. And the fact is, if you look at other system heads of anything like CUNY's complexity, uh, I believe they're virtually all compensated at a considerably higher uh, higher level. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Trustee Koaku? Yes. Um, I'd just like to bring the concern of some of my fellow students uh, in regard to the uh, increase in the salary range. Um, first of all, um, the reason why there is so much reluctance uh, from the student side is because of the misinformation that went out at first. Because the information that was given to the student was that the chancellor was getting an increase, which was not the truth. And uh, from the few I got a chance to meet with, I was able to explain the situation to them and tell them that it's just a review that's supposed to be happening every five years and that was conducted and it's only a review of the salary range. Now, from those I spoke to, uh, the main concern at this point of time is, um, yes, it's, an, it's a review for the salary range, but when will the actual increase happen? Because there's no timeline to that. Um, the chancellor was gracious enough to, you know, even uh, meet with me and uh, explain to me that there is no, at this point of time, uh, going to be any kind of increase in any kind of salaries at this point of time. But still, the students feel like um, because of the uh, recent wave of student activism that happened, especially starting from the tuition increase, the the student felt like uh, if there will be an increase in the uh, in the tuition for the next five years there should not even be a consideration of reviews, which I, to some extent I don't agree with personally. That's my personal opinion in regard to that because I believe if you work for any kind of company, your salary should be reviewed time to time. But the concern is that when will this actual increase be put forward towards the, uh, for the board? And the, the fear is this might happen in a year, in, in a year or two, and they won't really feel comfortable with that actual increase in salary being put forward if the tuition increase is going to be happening until the next uh, four years uh, um, moving forward. So that's the concern of the student body at this point of time. Uh, Trustee uh, Kafui, let, let me uh, say that the best I can say is that I have absolutely no plans at this point in time to recommend any salary increases for any members of the executive group, which probably numbers uh, close to 500 people here uh, in, in the university. Uh, to, to say when that would change is, is subject to lots of variables that are not clearly defined at this particular point in time. So for the immediate future, there is no plan at all and that was important for everybody to, to understand. 
Trustee Pantaleo. Uh, just a point of clarification. I referenced the Mercer study. I have no idea uh, whether or not that is confidential, but if trustees uh, want to see it, can, may, may they? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Jay, just, just ask uh, Jay and he'll get you a copy. Yeah. Uh, are there any other comments or questions? Uh, if not, with the revision noted, uh, are you ready? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Abstention, oh. Mr. Chair. Ab One abstention. Thank you very much. That item is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I hope that um, the correct information and interpretation is shared with our student body um, after, the, after this vote as well. Um, items 5C creates a new research professor title series that will bring the university's title structure for faculty in line with that of many research-oriented institutions. The new titles are distinct from the current faculty titles and that their focus is on research. Regular teaching assignments are not a component of the job description. Appointments may be made either within or outside of academic departments. These title definitions and qualifications, if approved, will be incorporated into a code of practice established for instructional staff titles by the Vice Chancellor for Human Resources Management, who will be responsible for establishing the initial salary ranges and terms and conditions of employment of these titles. Mr. Chair, I present item 5C for the board's consideration. I'll second that. Are there questions for the committee? Not all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions. That carries. Thank you. Item 5D proposes a title definition and qualification for Einstein professors. The title Einstein professor has been in existence at the university since 1979. The university reserves appointment as an Einstein professor to an elite cadre of outstanding scholars in scientific disciplines. The proposed title definition and qualifications, if approved, will be incorporated into a code of practice established for instructional staff titles by the Vice Chancellor for Human Resource Management. Mr. Chair, I present item 5D for the board's consideration. I'll second that. Are there questions on the Einstein professorships? Not all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Thank you. Item 5E, request approval of an interim governance plan for the new community college, which will enroll its first students in August. This initial plan is intended to guide the new college's operations during its early years with the understanding that as it grows, the governance plan may be revised to address evolving circumstances. The proposed plan is informed by the report of the Working Group on Governance and Organizational Structure, comprised of faculty and administrators from across the city university and other institutions. The work of the new Community College Governance Task Force comprised the faculty and staff of the college and supported by the university's general counsel and broad discussion with the college community. Mr. Chair, I present item 5E for the board's consideration. I'll second that. Are there questions on 5E? Not all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Item 5F involves amendments to the governance plan of Queensborough Community College in order to make it consistent with CUNY's bylaws, the bylaws of QCC faculty, and to modify current practices at QCC. These amendments were taken by the college in consultation with the Office of the General Counsel, have been approved by the QCC Academic Senate, and are recommended by the college president. The Board Committee on Faculty, Staff, and Administration recommends their adoption. Mr. Chair, I present item 5F for the Board's consideration. I'll second that. Are there questions on the uh, Queensboro plan? Not all in favor say aye. Aye. Any uh, negative abstentions? That carries. Item 5G also amends a governance plan, this one at City College, proposing a change in the college's promotion procedure. 
The proposed amendment states that if the department chairperson cannot chair the promotions committee because of his or her rank, the department faculty shall elect a member of the highest rank to be chairperson of the promotions committee rather than have the most senior person automatically serve as chairperson. Thus, the proposed change will ensure that department as a whole participates in the election of the chairperson of a promotions committee. Mr. Chair, I present item 5G for the board's consideration. Second that. Are there questions on this item? Not all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Item 5H names the Dave Fields Auditorium at CUNY School of Law. Dave Fields, University Dean and Special Counsel to the Chancellor, has bequeathed $1 million to the law school. His generosity through this gift will have an enormous impact on CUNY Law's ability to provide critical financial support to students and faculty alike. In recognition of his exemplary service to the CUNY School of Law and his generous request, it is recommended that the auditorium on the second floor of the law school's new building at 2 Court Street in Long Island City be named the Dave Fields Auditorium. Mr. Chair, I... I'll second that. All in favor, please. Adopted by acclamation. Thank you. <laughs> Item 5I names the Martin and Michelle Cohen Dean of Science Cohen Professorships and the Cohen Fund for Science at the City College of New York in recognition of the, Col the Cohen's pledge of $10 million for use by the college's Division of Science. This gift will create the college's first endowed deanship two endowed professorships, and a fund for science intended to fund the startup costs of the dean and professors. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, I present item 5I for the board's approval. I'll second that. Are there questions on the uh, Cohen gift? Not all in favor say aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? That carries. <clears throat> Items 5J, 5K, 5L, and 5M are naming opportunities at Baruch College which I will present as a group. They are the William Newman Department of Real Estate in the Zicklin School of Business, the William M. Newman Director of the Jewish Studies Center, the Richard A. Sandberg Class of 63 Lecture Hall, and the Sandra and Lawrence Simon Conference Room. Current and previous gifts associated with these names total almost $30 million. The Board Committee on Faculty, Staff, and Administration has reviewed them and recommends their approval. Mr. Chair, I present item 5J, K, and L for the Board's consideration. I'll second those items. Are there questions on the Baruch uh, naming? Not all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Item 5N and O are naming opportunities at Queens College, which I will also present together. They are the Dino, Dina Axelrod Perry Professorship in Economics, the Florence and Bernard Friedman Endowment for the Social Sciences, and the Florence Friedman Room. Mr. Chair, I present items 5N and 5O for the board's consideration. I'll second that. Are there questions? Not all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? That Those items carry. 5P designates three new distinguished professors, effective September 1st, 2012. The committee has reviewed each of these outstanding appointments and is pleased to recommend their approval. They are Dr. Dagmar Herzog, distinguished professor of history at the Graduate School and University Center, Dr. Jeffrey T. Parsons, distinguished professor of psychology at Hunter College, Dr. John Madison, Distinguished Professor of English at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Mr. Chair, I present these appointments for the board's approval. I'll second those, uh, not those motions. Are there questions about these distinguished professors? 
If not, all in favor say aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Those carry. Mr. Chair, I'm delighted that all of our new distinguished professors are here tonight. I therefore would like to invite President William Kelly to introduce Professor Herzog, after which President Jennifer Robb will introduce Professor Parsons, and Professor Jeremy Travis will introduce Professor Madison. Thank you, Trustee Beal. When in 2002, we first became interested in bringing Dagmar Herzog from Michigan State to the Graduate Center, we contacted more than a dozen senior scholars from across the country. Their responses were uniformly positive. Indeed, a striking light motif emerged from the letters we received. At a very early point in her career, Dagmar Herzog was, we were told, a rising star, poised to become, in the words of Anson Rabenbach at Princeton, one of the most innovative and productive scholars of her generation. She was, according to V.R. Burhan, the Seth Lowe Professor at Columbia, one of the most productive and imaginative historians of modern Germany of her generation. Far from hyperbolic, these assessments accorded with our own sense of Professor Herzog's achievement <coughs> and of her promise that judge <coughs> predicated primarily on two deeply engaging books, both published I by agree. Princeton University Press. These books linked religious thinking, intimate life, and public policy in modern Germany. The first of those books, Intimacy and Exclusion, Religious Politics and Pre-Revolutionary Baden, examined the ways in which debates within the German Christian community over sexuality, women's rights, and the status of Jews contributed to the formation of liberalism as a political force. By recentering religion as a primary element in the development of German liberalism, Professor Herzog reset the scholarly agenda, producing, in the words of Professor Michael Geyer of the University of Chicago, a paradigmatic effect which required scholars to think differently about 19th century German politics and the relation of those politics to religious life. Professor Herzog's second book, which was in production during our recruitment, shifted her focus to 20th century German history and to the central role sexuality played in German politics during and after the Third Reich. Sex after fascism, memory and morality in 20th century Germany traces the ways in which sexual morality was mobilized for political ends in both West and East Germany, as debates over sexual mores during the Nazi era became a vehicle for defining Germany's relation to its past and its conception of the future. That these books were supported by three significant collection of essays, service on major editorial boards, and deep, involve, and deep involvement in Holocaust education programs fueled our desire to bring Professor Herzog to the City University. That decision has yielded rich dividends in the decade that she has been with us. Professor Herzog has, said the tag, has shed the tag of emerging star of Wunderkind. She is now without question one of the world's leading historians of Germany and indeed of European and American life in the 19th and 20th centuries. To call her prolific is to do scant service. She has produced two more influential monographs, Sex and Crisis, The New Sexual Revolution and the Future of American Politics, published by Basic Books and Sexuality in Europe, a 20th Century History, published by Cambridge University Press. Two other books are in progress, With History in Mind, Psychoanalysis in a Post-War World, and Reproductive Rights and Disability Rights in the European Union. In addition, Professor Herzog has published more than 30 scholarly articles, more than 20 reviews. You may have seen one in yesterday's New York Times book review, and six, edit six edited collections. Further, she is the recipient of some of the most significant honors in her field. She has been a Mellon Fellow at Harvard, a member of the School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, a Fellow of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Humanities at Essen, a Frederick Burkhardt Fellow at the American Council of Learned Societies, a Da'a -A Day Scholar at Cornell. She has received significant grant support from the Social Science Research Council, the Ford Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Holocaust Educational Foundation. Earlier this spring, she was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. You will not be surprised to learn that the 15 internationally eminent scholars whom we contacted during this distinguished professor process were unanimous in their view that Professor Herzog had made path-breaking and enduring contributions in three critical fields, the history of religion, the history of the Holocaust, and the history of gender and sexuality. Indeed, her innovative work at the intersection of those three fields has made it impossible to think of any of them as distinct disciplines. Nancy Cott, the Trumbull Professor of American History at Harvard, told us that Professor Herzog's work in the history of sexuality stands above that of virtually any other scholar because of its brilliant originality and inclusiveness. 
Omer Bartov, the Birkelin Professor of European History at Brown, noted Professor Herzog's cutting edge methodologies and theoretical innovations. I can think of no one, he wrote, whom I would rather have as a member of my own department. Doris Bergen, the Wolf Professor of Holocaust Studies at Toronto, called Professor uh, Herzog's work on anti-Semitism and Holocaust memory indispensable. <coughs> I'd call your attention as well to Professor Herzog's remarkable record as a teacher and a mentor. This spring, her students in the history program took it upon themselves to nominate her for the American Historical Association's Nancy Lyman Rolker Mentorship Award. The standard packet for such nominations would include four or five testimonials. Professor Herzog's students presented 17, each a glowing tribute to her care and her support. Professor Herzog, one of those students wrote, has managed to combine the highest level of commitment to her own work with a genuine care for that of her students. For me, the most inspiring of these letters came from a student whose work was distant professor, from Professor Herzog's home fields and whose mentorship required the mastery of another scholarly literature. Although I am an historian of Japan, he wrote, Professor Herzog generously accepted me as one of her students. She has written countless letters on my behalf, introduced me to dozens of scholars, and tirelessly corrected my various applications, a daunting task given my non-native speaker's propensity <coughs> for errors in grammar. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I note my gratitude to Chancellor Goldstein and to the members of this board for the unfailing support of excellence at the Graduate Center and across the university is that commitment that enables us to attract and sustain faculty members of the caliber of Dagmar Herzog. It is with equal portions of pleasure and pride then that I present Dagmar Herzog to you as a candidate, in fact, now as CUNY's most recent distinguished professor. Thank you very much. when really I turned to writing to support my teaching habits. Um, <laughs> uh, I knew I loved teaching when I entered my first classroom at Brown University as a graduate student. It was European intellectual history. We taught Rousseau, Hegel, Nietzsche, Sartre, but just the real text, nothing else about it. Uh, and I was hooked, and I've loved it ever since. I've loved teaching since then, but I have never loved a university the way I love this one. I am so proud and so honored to be part of the city university system. I love the students I have, I love my colleagues, I certainly love my boss <laughs> and, and the big boss over there. Um, but there is no other university that so combines and makes possible the synergy between scholarship, teaching, and outreach to the wider public. And in my case, that means work with the media, speaking to general audiences, and also in my newest work on psychiatry and psychoanalysis, speaking with medical professionals and public health professionals. But this is an amazing institution. I am so privileged to be part of it, so thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it is a great pleasure to introduce uh, to the board and thank you for your support for the Jeff Parsons nomination for distinguished pr professor. Jeff, as you will hear, is an outstanding academic, and I am also very proud and privileged to call him a close colleague and friend. Dr. Parson is one of the world's leading experts in four areas of psychological and public health research, sexual health, substance abuse, the physical and mental health of lesbian, gay, bise bisexual, and transgendered people, and most prominently, HIV AIDS prevention. Dr. Parsons is one of our most prolific grant getters at Hunter College, bringing in over $30 million in research funds in 12 years with just recently two new R01s. Given the often controversial nature of Dr. Parsons' research and the sensitive and often taboo conclusions he reaches, I want to particularly thank Chairman Schmidt, the Board of Trustees, and the Chancellor for your support for this nomination. I believe it is one of the highest and strongest affirmations of academic freedom that this nomination has received, received such strong support throughout all levels of CUNY, completely on the merits and without regard to any controversy and conclusions that may arise from Dr. Parsons' research and conclusions. Among his many awards and honors, Dr. Parsons has won some of the most prestigious awards in his profession. The Distinguished Scientific Achievement Award from the American Psychological Association for his research in LBGT issues. The John Money Award from the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality. 
the leading professional society of multidisciplinary sexual health scientists. When political policy and science leaders need advice on matters related to HIV AIDS, they call Jeff Parsons. He chairs one of the two NIH study sections that provides scientific review of all HIV-related behavioral and social research. He is the editor-in-chief of sexuality, sexuality Research and Social Policy, an international interdisciplinary journal dedicated to empirical research on sexuality and its social science implications. In the past two years alone, he has been called upon by the National Institutes of Health, the Cent Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the New York City Department of Health, and even the White House to provide input to advance HIV AIDS policy and research. The only mystery is how we manage to be so innovative and productive as a scientist when he is on speed dial to the, for the federal government. And innovative and productive he is. When Jeff started working on AIDS research, almost all existing work focused on how to keep uninfected individuals from becoming HIV positive. Jeff was one of the first researchers in the world to focus his work on those already living with HIV and AIDS and study the unique prevention issues within this population. He pioneered the detailed study of sexual risk practices and harm reduction strategies used by HIV positive people to reduce the risk of transmitting HIV. One of the hallmarks of Dr. Parsons' work and one of the keys to his success is that his work keeps evolving and now Dr. Parsons studies the risk of HIV infection within long-standing gay relationships, among other topics. His record of peer-reviewed publications is over 200 and he is just 45 years old, which is qu quite astonishing. Jeff's work is outstanding, as every one of his reviewers note. But just as important, his work has, has a tremendous impact on people's lives. For example, Dr. Parsons developed and evaluated the only behavioral intervention thus far that actually works to increase HIV medication adherence among HIV-positive men and women. This intervention has been adopted and is being used across the U.S. in Thailand, China, and South Africa. His work on the role that methamphetamine use plays in dramatically increasing risky sexual behavior has directly informed public media campaigns in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and elsewhere to make people aware of the unique dangers of this substance. As the 15th Sur Surgeon General of the U.S., Dr. Jo Joycelyn Elder stated in her remarkable letter of recommendation for Jeff, if distinguished professor titles are reserved for faculty with records of exceptional performance by national and international standards of excellence in their profession, then certainly Dr. Parsons' scholarly contributions in terms of peer-reviewed publications and federal grant funding qualifies him for such a distinction. I could not agree more with Dr. Elders, and as Hunter's president, I want to add how important it is to us at Hunter that Jeff accomplishes all he does while being an exceptional classroom teacher. Many professors struggle to get students enrolled to come to class, but even students who are not enrolled in Dr. Parsons' class come to hear him lecture, often to standing room only crowds. He is a fierce and dedicated mentor to countless doctoral students in psychology at the Graduate Center and has also stepped forward to mentor his colleagues in the department. It takes a village, we believe, to make a distinguished professor, and I want to spend a moment of thank to thank a few people. First, to our uh, Vice Chancellor Lex Loeb for your support for, the, for Jeff through the controversial nature, um, as we've discussed, Jeff's subject matter to his research methods, to his findings, are often highly controversial and often end up being cited by Congress or press for their sensational nature. Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Alexa Loeb, provided her guidance and support for this nomination. She also uh, worked very well with us in uh, responding to the fact that Jeff is well known at Hunter and CUNY for pushing many boundaries. And I also want to thank our friend Richard Rothbard here who um, has worked closely with Jeff and us in making sure that we can accommodate all of Dr. Parsons' many evolving needs for his research portfolio. Finally, uh, our, chan our, our provost is here, Chancellor, who has been very supportive in both hiring Jeff when she was chair of the psychology department and nurturing his career as associate provost um, and as provost. Behind every great man, there are often other great men, and we want to thank today um, Jeff's partner, Chris, and particularly their son, uh, Henry. Now, Henry asked a very important question uh, regarding the Distinguished Professor nomination, which was whether it came with a trophy. Um, <laughs> and it seemed to me that uh, it should. So, Henry, I was wondering if Henry could come up and get um, his father's trophy. <laughs>
And then we also, that's not as much fun. <laughs> It is a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeff Parsons, Henry's dad, and our new distinguished professor. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, this is an incredible um, honor. and. I've been called many things in my life, um, both professionally and personally, but distinguished has never been one of them. So this is, um, this is, is quite a treat, and I'm honored and humbled um, to be here and to be given this honor. And I really want to um, acknowledge and thank um, some amazing women who have, have participated in this process in my own professional development. First of all, President Rob. Um, no academic could wish for a more dedicated and supportive president. It's just impressive and thrilling to be able to work with her. And as she's indicated, being supportive of me is not always easy when I end up on news reports and when my research gets uh, twisted for political purposes and the like. Um, when she first tried to reach out to me to let me know about this, I saw on my cell phone that I had a missed call from President Rob. And my immediate reaction was to Google my own name to see if some new scandalous report had come out um, before I called her back. And having not seen my name in Google, um, I was able to call her and she told me the good news. But it is that type of relationship that we have and that I treasure and enjoy very much. Um, Provost uh, Vita Rabinowitz, who hired me when she was chair of psychology, um, has been an amazing and supportive influence. And, and she hired me um, about 12 years ago, and I've proceeded to make her life difficult pretty much ever since. Um, her unwavering support and belief in the type of work that we do and how it can um, change and save lives means very much to me. And uh, it's hard to imagine anybody who could be more sort of professionally and, and personally supportive of the type of work. She brought me to Hunter College when I was young and had potential. Um, <coughs> she saw that potential and nurtured it and supported it to help me become the scientist that I am today, and I'm always going to be grateful for that. I'd also like to thank my chair, Vani Quinones Janab. Um, the Hunter Psych Department could not have a better leader, and I say this as the former chair. So um, I'm really particularly proud that Hunter and CUNY have recognized someone like me who does controversial psychological health research that's focused on sexuality and sexual risk behavior with this type of honor. Um, unlike many other institutions, CUNY values scientific merit and advancing knowledge rather than shying away from controversy. And I also share this honor with the many wonderful and amazing CUNY students that I've really had the pleasure to work with, and I'm glad that I'm, I have the opportunity here at CUNY to train the next generation of scientists who are going to focus on sexual health research and continue to advance the field forward. I find it amazing that, that the former G Surgeon General, Joycelyn Elders, wrote a letter of support for um, my promotion, um, and I, I sort of think of how far we've come. In 1994, Jocelyn Elders was fired from her position as Surgeon General of the United States for talking about masturbation, and now 18 years later, I'm promoted to Distinguished Professor for talking about gay sex. So I think we have come quite a ways. <laughs> the work that we do at my research center um, does save and change lives, and so it is something that we all take incredibly seriously and are, are very focused on. We, we like to say that we take our work seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously. And I think it's that balance that makes us able to do the very sensitive and oftentimes challenging work that we do, but still um, maintain the balance between um, professional work and our personal lives. Um, I've had the privilege to work with so many wonderful colleagues at my research center over the years. and. Every day I get to go to work is an exciting prospect and a wonderful day, and it's gratifying to be recognized for that type of work. Um, I also finally want to thank the men in my life, um, my partner of 23 years, Chris, um, 
and our amazing son, Henry, who you just got to meet. They are my motivation and my inspiration and my joy on a daily basis. And we laugh together and, and love um, each other so much. And they make a lot of sacrifices so that I can do the type of work that I do. Um, and so I hope that, that um, Henry will realize that even though this award doesn't normally come with a trophy, but it did this time, um, that it is in, an incredible honor and eventually he'll fully understand what it means and I hope that he'll be very proud of his daddy Jeff and I thank you all very much. Chancellor Goldstein, uh, members of the board, uh, it is uh, with distinct pleasure that uh, I come before you today uh, to present John Madison uh, for appointment to the rank of uh, CUNY Distinguished Professor of English at John Jay College and to take this opportunity to thank the board for its support of that idea. Uh, Professor Madison, I'd like to point out, will join uh, seven other John Jay faculty members whose exceptional scholarship has earned them appointments as distinguished professors. And the fact is that three of these are professors of history. And the added fact that as of today, John Madison is a professor of English attests to the strength of the college's liberal arts faculty, the importance of the liberal arts to our mission of educating for justice, and the quality of education that we provide in the liberal arts, which is now a renewed focus at John Jay, thanks to the support from Chancellor Goldstein and the university. So a few words about John Madison. As is reflected in John's CV, uh, John has an AB in history from Princeton and a PhD in English from Columbia. And it might sound like that was a traditional pathway to an academic career. However, he also holds a JD from Harvard and first practiced as a litigating attorney in California, North Carolina, and then made the brave and for us fortuitous decision to then pursue life as an academic and not a lawyer. John has spent over 15 years at John Jay, during which he built an international reputation for his scholarship in 19th century American literary and cultural history. In 2008, his double biography of Louisa May Alcott and her father, Bronson Alcott, received the 2008 Pulitzer Prize for biography. Chancellor Goldstein will recall that we learned of this decision by the Pulitzer Committee when Chancellor Goldstein came to John Jay for what he thought was a rather routine member a meeting with the members of our faculty, we were then interrupted by the news that John had won the Pulitzer. Within five years of that extraordinary achievement, John has now published The Lives of Margaret Fuller, a book that was even more enthusiastically received than its Pulitzer Prize winning predecessor, with glowing reviews in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, Cleveland Plain Dealer, and The New Yorker, among many other newspapers and magazines. Distinguished Professor Joel Meyerson writes that this book, quote, will solidify Madison's reputation as one of the finest literary biographers writing today. Indeed, says Meyerson, I would place him in terms of 19th century American literature at the top. Professor Madison's external letters of evaluation from some of the leading scholars of 19th century American literature attest to his unusual ability to combine deep and groundbreaking archival research with insightful literary criticism. As to the quality of his writing, the consensus is that Professor Madison is a distinguished stylist. His prose is described as elegant, graceful, clear, beautiful, dramatically suspenseful, and eloquent. He is described as drawing, quote, effortlessly from literary, intellectual, cultural, and social history, as well as a deep knowledge of human nature that conveys how individuals both shape and are shaped by their world. Professor Gregory Iselin writes that Eden's Outcast is, quote, without question, the best biographical work done on the Alcotts, and is, in my view, along with Louis Menon's The Metaphysical Club, one of the two greatest pieces of literary history written in the 21st century. Professor Madison is a fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society 
a former fellow of the Leon Levy Center of Biography, where he now serves as deputy director. He's contributed his scholarship to such organizations and activities as the Louisa May Alcott Memorial Association, the National Endowment of the Humanities Landmarks Program, the Louisa May Alcott Society, the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center, and the Biographers International Organization. His work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Harvard Theological Review, the New England Quarterly, and Leviathan, a journal of Melville Studies. Closer to home, Professor Madison has also received the Distinguished Faculty Award presented by the John Jay College Alumni Association. In addition to being a distinguished scholar, Professor Madison is also a beloved teacher and mentor and an active citizen of the college, serving most recently as the faculty director of the John Jay Honors Program, which paved the way for John Jay's admission to Macaulay Honors College. There's no doubt in my mind that Professor Madison will continue to be as productive and well-regarded a scholar in the coming years as he had been this past decade. He is presently under contract with Norton for an annotated edition of Little Women. His article on Margaret Fuller's summer on Margaret Fuller's Summer on the Lakes has been accepted for publication in 19th century prose. And he's working on a prospectus for biography, one that he discussed this morning with Chairman Schmidt, of Oliver Wendell Holmes. He shows, shows no signs of slowing his pace. So now with the board's approval in hand, we happily welcome John Madison into the ranks of distinguished professor in the, distingu in the discipline of English in his home at John Jay College. with my fellow admittees, this is really quite overwhelming, uh, and, and I, I do thank you all. It, it, it's been said that overnight success uh, takes 15 years, uh, and it's either a comic coincidence or evidence of the eternal fitness of things that I walked into my first CUNY classroom precisely 15 autumns ago. And it's hard to imagine where the time has gone. I think probably about nine years of it uh, went to grading papers. but. Um, <laughs> But obviously much of it, too, has gone into to writing books and, and articles. It's also been spent raising a daughter from the age of three to the verge of attending college and informing professional friendships both within and beyond this university that I hold incredibly, uh, indescribably dear. It's been my great good fortune to teach at the John Jay um, English Department, a rare collection of dear friends and consummate professionals. Uh, as notable for their generosity and collegiality as for their impressive feats of scholarship. I've had the pleasure of sharing countless hours with my students at John Jay who have never ceased to inspire me with their eagerness, their courage, and their persistence in facing every challenge. I have served, thankfully, under a quintet of outstanding department chairs, Bob Crozier, Tim Stevens, Chris Suggs, Marnie Tabb, and Allison Pease, each of whom is, who has made an indispensable contribution to my life as a scholar. I've also enjoyed serving under a pair of exceptional college presidents, Gerald Lynch and, of course, Jeremy Travis, um, who have become deservedly synonymous with educating for justice. In fact, I would like to, to pause for a very special word for President Travis, this wonderful man who has guided John Jay with such unparalleled grace, patience, and vision since his appointment in 2004 uh, I have to say, one's work matters a great deal more when one is able to do it for someone whom one deeply and sincerely admires. And for the past eight years, I have not achieved anything without saying to myself how wonderful it is to be doing this for Jeremy. And so, Jeremy, I thank you so, so very, very much. Um, more recently, uh, at the Lee and Levy Center, I've been placed in proximity with yet another marvelous group of thinkers and doers. Um, President Kelly, um, Cannot, I, I cannot even put into words for you. I, I'm, I'm sorry, to, sorry to let you down, but so it comes. <laughs> uh, uh, Provost Chase Robinson and the incomparable Gary Giddens. Uh, indeed, how lucky can one man be? Um, but the fact is that before that autumn 15 years ago, I wasn't feeling all that lucky. Uh, I hope you'll bear with me as I go through some of the background. In, in 1991, just four months after marrying my wife, Michelle, I had left a secure career as a lawyer to attend graduate school in English. A lot of people, including my parents, thought I was crazy. 
But I knew that there was a part of my soul that would wither and die if I chose not to follow the shining star that is, for me, the love of literature. And corny as it may sound, I had also recently seen the movie Field of Dreams, that Kevin Costner movie about a farmer who plows under his cornfield and builds a ball field because a voice has told him, if you build it, he will come. Now, on the surface, of course, it's a baseball film. But more importantly, it's about making unpopular choices. It's making those choices that you could never possibly explain to anyone, but are both right and indispensable. In 1991, I was 30, pardon me, I was 30 years old. I knew that if I didn't start building my ball field soon, it would never be built. And so I set away for applications. I studied for the GRE at night after work and managed to gain admission to just one, just one of the programs to which I applied. I sold my car, traded my lawyer's salary for a grad student stipend, and set about building my dream. Well, in 1997, the year that I first came to John Jay, that dream was in doubt. A child had come along for whom I had become the primary caregiver. And so there was no chance for me to publish articles or give conference papers as my grad school colleagues were doing. I had my hands full just writing my dissertation. I went to three MLA conferences in consecutive years, secured a total of one job interview. On the plane to that interview, I developed laryngitis for the first and only time in my life and, and at the interview could barely speak. <laughs> I thought it was over, but then along came John Jay. A grad school colleague of mine knocked on my door one evening. He showed me an ad in the Chronicle of Higher Ed advertising a position for a professor who could teach law and literature. So I applied, interviewed on campus, and did not get the job. <laughs> it went instead to a highly qualified applicant who had also served as one of Angela Davis's lawyers. You can't beat that for PC cred. But thank heavens, my mother raised me right. I sent a thank you letter to the chair of the department and told him I was available if he needed anyone to fill some sections. In mid-August, the phone call came. John Jay had two sections of freshman comp and two sections of modern European lit. Did I want them? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> so that was how it started. A full-time subline that turned into a 15-year association leading in turn, thank heavens, to today's appointment. Now, I tell that story not because I think it says anything about me, but I think it says a great deal about John Jay and the City University in general. These are institutions that have always stood for the creation of opportunity, for discovering talent where others saw nothing special, for believing in someone, be she or he, a student or an instructor, when nobody else believed. And so in 1997, John Jay gave me a shot, and it was all that I needed. And I'm proud to say today how grateful I am. So that movie, Field of Dreams, said, if you build it, he will come. Well, amazingly enough, it wasn't a fairy tale. I did build that ball field, and people have come. But what matters now, and what matters most to me, is that every day at the City University, countless people whom you and I haven't met yet, people with faith and hope and no tools other than their hearts and minds and hands are working on their own ball fields. Year by year, credit by credit, those ball fields slowly take their wondrous shapes. Every one of them looks different in the mind of the person who's building it. Some of them, sadly, will never be finished, but the fact is, the fact that they're being built is the thing that is always to be remembered, and it is this remarkable university that makes them possible. This university that we all serve is doing a mighty, generous, irreplaceable work. Each day, we continue to build it, and Thank heavens, the people do come. Thank you um, for a wonderful presentation. Mr. Chair, I will continue with my report. <laughs> um, items 5Q names the Anya and Andrew Shiva Gallery in the new building at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in consideration of the donor's pledge of $5 million to support the college doctoral program in forensic and criminal and clinical psychology. Mr. Chair, I present items 5Q for the board's approval. I'll second the item. Is there any question or discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That carries. 
Um, I now wish to present two additional items that have come to our attention, which we would like, which we would ask the board to consider at this time in the best interests of the colleges. Copies of these resolutions are on your table. Item 5R involves an honorary naming at the College of Staten Island. I will read this resolution in its entirety. Resolved that the Board of Trustees of the City University of New York approve the naming of the baseball field at the College of Staten Island at the Thomas D. Morales Baseball Field. Explanation, Dr. Morales, the third president of the College of Staten Island, has served in that capacity since 2007. During his tenure, President Morales has been a staunch supporter of student athletics as a way to promote student success and build the campus community. To enhance campus support for intercollegiate and intramural sports, President Morales instituted the CSI Scholar Athlete Honor Roll and the CSI Future of Athletics Advisory Task Force. The college also hosted nine CUNY AC championships. President Morales was honored with the 2011-12 CUNY AC Ellis Bullock Jr. Award and the 2012 CSI Athletics Distinguished Service Award for his commitment to excellence in education and student athletics. In recognition of President Morales' service to the university, to the College of Staten Island, and his commitment to his students, it is proposed that the baseball field at CSI be named in his honor. Mr. Chair, I am delighted to present item 5R for the board's consideration. Thank you very much. I'll second it. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed abstention? Surely if they build it. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Our final, Next item. Our final added item, number 5S, is also a critical personal, personnel action which we put forward in the best interests of the institution. It is the appointment of Dr. Neil L. Cohen as Acting Dean of the School of Public Health at Hunter College, effective July 2, 2012. Dr. Cohen currently serves as Acting Associate Provost for Health and Social Welfare at Hunter College. Prior to joining Hunter in 2011, he served in a variety of capacities in academia, government, and the private sector. In addition, for over 20 years, Dr. Cohen has served in teaching positions at both Mount Sinai School of Medicine and New York University School of Medicine. The college president strongly recommends his appointment to this acting position. Mr. Chair, I present item 5S for the board's approval. Second. Thank you. Are there questions or discussion on this item? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed abstention. That carries. And that, Mr. Chair, concludes my report. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, we'll turn next to the Committee on Facilities Planning and Management. Uh, call on Trustee uh, Frieda Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Board of Trustees Committee on Facilities Planning and Management considered seven items at its meeting of June 4, 2012. These action items are listed in the Board meeting as calendar item 6A through G. A. Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship it's a lease agreement, to authorize the General Counsel to execute a 10-year lease for approximately 7,200 rentable square feet of space at 215 West 125th Street in New York, New York, for use by the CUNY Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. The new CUNY facility will provide assistance, essential services, and appropriate space for offices to set up companies created by CUNY faculty. The landlord shall perform improvements to the space specified by the university. The university will reimburse the landlord for its share of the university requested improvements. The landlord will be responsible for exterior, structural, and interior repairs and cleaning. The university will be also be responsible for increases in real estate taxes and direct operating expenses. The proposed new lease will be for a 10-year period based upon the following terms. An annual base rent not to exceed $273,600 per year 
and the second five-year period not to exceed $295,200 per year. Item B, Megar Evers College five-year lease renewal. To authorize the General Counsel to execute a five-year lease renewal for approximately 7,000 rentable square feet of space at 1665 Bedford Avenue in Brooklyn, New York, on behalf of Medgar Evers. The college has been a tenant since mid-2002, and the current lease expires on August 31, 2012. The building houses a bookstore and the admission service center. The university and the landlord have agreed to renew the lease for a new five-year period at an annual rental not to exceed 140,000 per rentable square feet. The landlord will continue to be responsible for real estate taxes, exterior structural and roof and interior repairs, and the university will be responsible for the cleaning. Item C, Hostos Community College Master Plan Amendment. To approve an amendment to the Hostos Community College Master Plan, originally approved in 1984 by the CUNY Board of Trustees, the amendment proposes strategies to address at the anticipated growth at the college and the need to modernize facilities for instructional space and student support services. The Hostos Community College campus, located on a 5.8 acre campus in the South Bronx, has been expanding to the west along Walton Avenue with the building of the Savoy Building at 149th Street, conversion of an old garage at 146th Street, and two trailer sites in the same area utilized by the Campus Facilities Department and the Hostos Immigration Center. The most recent acquisition for the campus is 135 East 144th Street, the carpet building, at the corner of East 144th Street and Walton Avenue. These facilities provide a total of 348,029 net assignable square feet. Fall 2009 shows an enrollment of 4,488 full-time equivalent students. Hostos Community College has a current space need of 470,177 net assignable square feet when benchmarked against similar community colleges. The current conditions represent a deficit of 122,148 net square feet. This master plan amendment is based on a projected 2020 college enrollment of 6,528 full-time enrollees requiring a total of 540,390 net assignable square feet, a projected deficit of 192,361 square feet. The master plan amendment updates and revises the findings presented in the 1984 master plan and calls for new construction and the renovation of existing facilities to meet the space need. The City University Construction Fund Board of Trustees approved the selection of the design firm of Mitchell Gorgola Architects on October 22, 2008. Item D, Hunter College Science and Health Professions Project to authorize CUNY to undertake a public-private project with Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center for the acquisition of vacant land at 525 East 73rd Street and to develop with the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, the Hunter College Science and Health Professions building on its portion of the property. CUNY and Memorial Sloan will acquire and joint, jointly develop the 73rd Street property currently owned by the City of New York. The joint development at 73rd Street property will include the Hunter College Science Building, a new 300,000 square foot building to serve Hunter's School of Nursing and Health Professions and upper level science classes, and a new 700,000 square foot outpatient cancer center for Memorial Sloan Kettering. Currently, Hunter's health services and nursing programs are located on the Hunter Brookdale campus at East 25th Street and First Avenue. CUNY's contribution to the acquisition of the 73rd Street property will be a portion of the Brookdale campus, which will be transferred to the city. As a result, the programs at Brookdale will need to be temporarily relocated until the Hunter College Science Building is completed. Land use approvals for the 73rd Street property are expected to be complete by the fall of 2013. CUNY has identified approximately 85,000 square feet of space that can be renovated at LaGuardia Community College's Center 3 building to house the Brookdale t programs temporarily. When the Brookdale programs vacate the Center 3 space to move to the Hunter College Science building, the space will be turned over to LaGuardia Community College for its use. 
The Center 3 renovation will be developed in accordance with LaGuardia Community College's master plan. Construction of the temporary space at LaGuardia Center, Center 3 is anticipated to be complete by the fall of 2015. Combined, these phases are estimate, estimated to cost approximately $54 million of existing state appropriated funds. The Hunter College Science Building is estimated to cost $450 million in state appropriated funds and is anticipated to be complete by fall 2019. E. Hunter College Wild Cornell Medical College agreements to authorize on behalf of Hunter College a public private project with Wild Cornell, Wild Cornell Medical, Center, Medical College for the acquisition of a full research floor at the new 18 story medical research fa facility being constructed by Wild Cornell at 413 East 69th Street. CUNY intends to purchase on behalf of Hunter College the Hunter Research Floor, a condominium unit consisting of the fourth floor of the new 18-story Will Cornell Research Building. The Will Cornell Research Building is scheduled to be completed for spring 2014 occupancy. As the owner of, the flo of a floor at the, Cornell, at the Cornell Research Building, uh, Hunter College will enjoy joint use of vivarium conference rooms, lounges, and other common areas. It is anticipated the researchers from Hunter College who utilize the facility will generate a substantial number of federal and other grants in support of the operation. The above agreements will formalize the respective roles of the Cornell Center and CUNY with respect to the acquisition and operation of the research building, which will be managed by an affiliate of Wild Cornell. The purchase price of $65 million is supported by two appraisals performed at CUNY's request. The New York State Dormitory Authority will finance the purchase cost through a state appropriation and the project is subject to approval by the New York State Attorney General and New York State Controller. On June 27, 2011, calendar number item B8, the board authorized CUNY to enter into a letter of intent for the project and that letter of intent was executed on October 4th, 2011. Item F, Mega Evers College amendment to pool renovation on Carroll Street, on the Carroll Street side. To authorize the amendment of the resolution adopted at the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees held on April 27, 2009. Calendar number B6 to execute a uh, contract on behalf of Medgar Evers College to renovate the pool facility in the Carroll Street building. The amendment will increase the authorized amount for construction and management services from $2.2 million to $3.3 million. The increased amount is necessary to cover the modifications to electrical, mechanical, and gutter systems and modify pool area and women's locker rooms to comply with ADA guidelines. The fund on behalf of the City University of New York reconstructed the existing pool in the Carroll Street building. Due to unforeseen conditions, modifications to the mechanical, electrical, and pool gutter systems were required during construction. The college requested an increase in scope to modify the pool area and women's locker room in order to comply with ADA guidelines, and as a result of these changes, an increase of design, construction, and management fees is needed. Item G. Queens College Resolution for Campus-Wide Fire Alarm Project Phase 1 to authorize a purchase order for the services to design, purchase, and install fire alarm systems in the Clapper Hall Science Building and Music Building, including central monitoring station at Queens College. Existing fire alarm systems in these buildings are not in compliance with current New York City building and fire codes and are not functional. In order to use Clapper Hall Science Building and the Music Building with required safe fire safety, the fire alarm system in these buildings must be replaced immediately. The total cost of all purchases shall be chargeable to the State Capital Construction Fund for an amount not to exceed $6 million. I hereby request your approval of these calendar items. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll second those items. Are there questions on any of them? If not, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Those items carry. Thank you. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll turn next to the Committee on Student Affairs and Special Programs, uh, Trustee Kathleen Pasilli.
7B, and uh, let me repeat them for you. Calendar item 7A, LaGuardia Community College. Student activity fee increase. This resolution increases the student activity fee paid by students at LaGuardia Community College by $12 for full-time students from $55.85 to $67.85 and by $6 for part-time students from $20.85 to $26.85 to establish an intercollegiate athletics program at the college. This new fee will be allocated by the college association. A referendum was held at the college in which the vote was 809 in favor and 309, uh, 390 opposed, with 7.7% of the eligible students voting in the referendum. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my report on calendar item 7A. I'll second that motion. Are there questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Calendar item 7B, City College, student activity fee, undergraduate students. The student activity schedule represents an increase of $15 for full-time undergraduate students, uh, $7.50 for part-time undergraduate students, and a $4 <laughs> increase in the undergraduate summer session student activity fee. This will increase the fee from $49.35 to $64.35 for full-time students, from $33.35 to $40.85 for part-time students, and $8 to 12, from $8 to $12 for summer session. This fee will increase the earmarking <clears throat> to Student fa uh, Faculty Committee on Intercollegiate Athletics. A student activity fee referendum was held at the college in which the vote was 1,632 in favor and 1,003 opposed to the increase. City College should be commended for obtaining a 20% participation rate on this referendum. This is the first increase in the student activity fee since 1996. The earmarking for athletics has remained unchanged since 1985. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report on calendar item 7B. I'll second that motion. Are there questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions. That carries. And finally, cal calendar item 7C, the City University of New York amendments to the policy on payment of stipends to student leaders. I wish to present an additional item that has come to our attention, which we would ask the board to consider at this time in the best interest of the university. This resolution is included on the revised calendar, copies of which uh, are around the table. This resolution amends the board policy on payment of stipends to student leaders. In accordance with the board policy, the chancellor has reviewed the schedule of stipend payments since stipends were last increased in July 2004. The proposed revisions increase the maximum allowable stipends by 11.45% on July 1, 2012, and by 11.45% on July 1, 2013. In accordance with the 22.9% increase in the Consumer Price Index, known as the CPI, for all urban consumers in New York City and Northern New Jersey, from July 2004 through May 2012, by increasing the cap over a two-year period, the USS and the college associations will have a better opportunity to budget for these increases, should they choose to even do so. The implementation of the increase in the amounts to be paid to student leaders shall be determined by the chancellor. I would now like to uh, ask. I'll second that. Are there questions on the student stipends? <laughs> any other discussion all in favor say aye. aye aye any opposed abstentions that carries mr chairman i have two information items i would like to share with the board at this time 
I would personally like to thank Vice President for Student Affairs, Ramona Brown, and her staff at the College of Staten Island for the terrific job they did in helping me to coordinate a very successful first initiative in showcasing CSI honors students with a visit to the office of the New York State Controller Thomas Dinopoli last week. Controller Dinopoli was very gracious and spent over an hour with the students who were in awe of, the, of this experience, which for most I found represented the first time they would meet any high-ranking official. We are now in uh, collaboration with the Controller's Office to schedule students uh, from Baruch College for next semester. And in addition, I would like to acknowledge uh, the CUNY Coalition of Students with Disabilities for their continuing participation uh, in the 107th annual AKC Staten Island Kennel Dog Show, which was held at the College of Staten Island this past weekend. Their support was well appreciated by the many exhibitors as well as the show dogs. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. I'd like to give uh, just notice of a non-action item that the Executive Committee on May 21st, 2012 uh, uh, accepted a proposal of the Chancellor that William J. Fritz be appointed interim president of the College of Staten Island uh, for a period of uh, up to two years. Uh, as the uh, college uh, uh, completes the uh, academic and administrative initiatives that have been uh, commenced under the leadership of President Morales. That, was, uh, that item is, is noticed on page 39 of your, uh, of your board book. Uh, before we go into executive session, that concludes our public business. I want to wish everyone a uh, happy and productive summer, uh, and we look forward to uh, seeing you uh, early in the fall. We'll now go into executive session.